So I'd like to start out by congratulating you. You made it to the last Sunday of 2020. Anybody here excited about that? Yay, yeah, like we are almost done, right? Almost just a, a few more days and we'll hit 21 and see what does that have for us. Uh, but anyway, so we are going back to the book of Psalms, uh, Psalms chapter 4. Uh, last week we were in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And then next week we are going to start the New Testament book of Acts and see how long it takes us to get through that. But it, um, I wanted to start on the new year with a new book, so we're just going to sneak in another one from the book of Psalms before we do that. So Psalms chapter 4, let me read it to you. It says, and this is David speaking, it says, Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are in your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any, any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their new grain and wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. God, I thank you for this reading of your word. God, I thank you that there's so much in this that, um, that we can take from this. And I, I know that, God, I'm not going to hit every part of this. And I pray that you would help what, it, what I say to be your words. And that whatever else we need to hear as we go through this passage, that you'd speak to us individually as we need it. And I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's message is persistent in positives, which sounds like a great New Year's Eve message, right? A New Year's Day or a New Year's get ready for the New Year kind of message, which just happened to be that way. That wasn't the, the thought in mind as I was going through this. But as I was, I was reading it, all that could stand out to me was to be persistent in positive things. Uh, and everybody understands that this time of year. We're, we're looking forward to 21. I won't ask who made New Year's resolutions because no one ever raises their hands and says, I've made one. But people understand this idea of being persistent, uh, especially when you're starting afresh. Uh, practice. If you're going to play basketball, you're going to have to be persistent in it if you're going to be good. If you're going to be practicing music, anything like that. In exercise, you know, not to pick on Chloe and Sophie yesterday, but yesterday Caleb and I were out playing basketball. We're doing this fun, like, sort of exercise stuff, and here comes two bolts of lightning around the corner, down the street, being persistent in something that I don't believe in. <laughs> so good job, Chloe and Sophie. You can be persistent in savings, right? If you're going to accumulate money, unless money just keeps pouring into your account, you're going to have to be persistent. So you get this idea of being persistent in good things. Today we're going to be looking at two things that David demonstrated that we can learn that we need to be persistent in, uh, starting today, throughout the rest of 21, if we get the whole year, down to as many years as comes. One is being persistent in prayer, and the other is being persistent in godliness. So first of all, David was persistent in prayer. Psalms 401 says, Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayers. So if you remember, uh, two weeks ago we were in Psalms chapter 3. And it was, I didn't realize it at the time, but Psalms 3 and Psalms 4 are thought to be like a sequel, like Psalms 3 was written in the morning, Psalms 4 was written another day, so this is a continuation of what we have looked at. So I want to recap for everybody who maybe has forgotten or wasn't here, what happened in Psalms chapter 3 that caused that to be written and lead us into Psalms chapter 4. So in Psalms chapter 3, there's a little heading that says, A Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. David was a king. He had lots of wives. He had lots of kids. Well, son number one and son number three had the same dad, David, and they had different moms. Well, son number one raped the sister of son number of brother number three of, of Absalom. And David, as the king and as the dad, did absolutely nothing about it. Absalom didn't appreciate that. Two years later, he conspired to have his brother Am Ammon killed. 
Well, then he had to flee for his life, and he was gone for three years. Finally, David welcomed him back. He forgave him, and everything seems like it's fine. Doesn't sound like there's any kind of issues going on. But after four years of conspiring to take over the throne, Absalom succeeds. He's stolen the hearts of all the people, and he has it announced that he's now king. And then David and his men start to flee. And this is what was written in Psalms chapter 3, where he's running for his life, but he's asking God to help him. And to protect him. In Psalms chapter 4, it's connected. David is still has this idea of still being persistent and praying for God to deliver him out of this situation and to help him to know what to do. He's asking in the first part of this prayer, there's three parts to this prayer. He calls on God to fix the situation. He reminds God of his past help. And the third thing he does is he admits that he really does in need God's help. So the first thing, he says, answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. He's calling on God to save, his, save him, to help him out of the situation. He's not giving up on God. This is kind of a desperate situation. People in desperate times do desperate things. He could do a number of rash decisions, but he's starting out saying, God, please help me. He's not resorting to other options. He didn't run to the neighboring uh, countryside and just start collecting people and say, let's gather this all up and let's go back and fight. He, he says, I'm going to God. He didn't even say, you know what, God, I got this pretty good plan. I used to, I'm a general, I'm the king. Caleb, knock it off. I'm a king. I have all these, this experience. He says, I'm going to God. I'm not going to ask God to bless this. I'm just going to do the, uh, go to him and ask him to help me first. So that's what David did. He's got this situation going on, and he says, I'm going to God first with my problem. Guess what we should be doing? When we got a situation, we should be going to God first with our situation, not giving up on God. Anybody here ever go through a tough time in life and then think, why do I want to... It's, it's tough to turn to God because God allowed this situation in the first place. How, why would I want to go talk to God? He, he helped me to get in this or this situation. Um, but that's what some people do. They just say, you know what? God allowed this. I'm not going to God. Other people say, I'm going to find some other method out of this. I'm going to use my brain power and figure out how to get out of this situation. I'm going to go talk to mom and dad. I'm going to go talk to somebody else and say, help, get me out of this. And some of us, this has been me from time to time. I, I use all this brain power and I think really hard and I come up with an answer to what I think is going to work. And then what do I do? I say, God, please bless my decision. And that's not what I should be doing, right? The very first thing I should be doing is going to God and asking him to fix the situation. That's what David did. That's what I need to do. The second thing David did was he reminded God of his past answers to prayer. Um, and let's see, he says, give me relief from my distress. It sounds like in the NIV, like he's asking God to get him out of this situation. But in the King James Version, it says, thou hast enlarged me. Okay, that's kind of an odd sounding phrase, but it means to enlarge, to extend, to open wide. And it's used of giving a person space or relief in a time of danger. So David says, I've been, I've been surrounded. I've been in danger and you have opened the door and you have set me free. You have, you have made, you've taken the stress. You've taken the burden away from me. God, could you please do it again? I remember God, this is what you did in the past. And I'm asking you to do it again. David is saying, you know, uh, like we saw, we looked at last week, David has a relationship with God. He didn't just start out the very first time he had a problem and saying, God, please help me. It's this continuous, ongoing relationship. And so as we saw in uh, Psalms chapter 3, that he's able to relax. He's able to lie down and to sleep. Even in the stressful and, and terrible times that he's in, he can still say, okay, God, I can trust you. My situation is still the same, but I'm going to trust you at the same time. And I'm still going to rely on you to get me out of this predicament. It's a continuation of those same thoughts. David thought back. He says, God, you got me out of this. And I'm thinking of all these uh, examples of what you did for me in the past. Guess what you and I should do? I should remember to think back, what did God do for me in the past? 
and, and use that as encouragement to trust God moving forward. I think about this year. It's the year 2020. Thankfully, it's almost done. It's been a crazy year. And I think about just my own personal life, my example, my gallbladder that everybody's tired of hearing about, that I just keep bringing up any chance that I get. And I think about the most miserable pain of my life and how God got me through it. He got me to the doctors who referred me to uh, a specialist or something in order to get that taken care of and immediately and right before the virus happened so it didn't have to be get put off on a back burner over and over again. That might not seem like a very big deal, but I look and say, you know what? Thank you, God. You did that for me in the past. I know I can trust you moving forward. And God likes that. God likes it when we remember uh, the, the past good things that he has done in scriptures. I think about getting Mally and all the, all the work that's gone into having her. And all the times where we are praying and asking for wisdom and asking for help. And what do we do? You have a little girl versus boys. You can spank one. You can't spank the other. And there's just so many dynamics between the two that are different. And God has come through multiple times. I think about the hundred times we drove to Billings this year. For Mally, for Leslie, for, for life. And think about all those times God kept us safe. And before I leave, I can easily say, hey, God... You did it before. You got me safe to Billings before. Please get me safe going back home uh, or going back to Billings the next time. So the first thing David did was he called on God to fix his situation. Why could he do that? It wasn't just out of desperation. It's because he could remember, this is what you did for me in the past. He had a relationship. He had confidence. He says, okay, now I can move forward with asking God to help me. And he does. Uh, the first, number three, he asks God to be merciful to him. To be merciful is to show favor. It's a gracious act towards someone in need. David is saying, you know what, God? I am in a situation where I need help. David says, I'm not going to or I can't do anything unless you help me to get through this. He says, please be merciful. He didn't exhaust all his other options first. He didn't try to go to battle first and then say, okay, I couldn't do it on my own. God, please help me. He says, that's the very first thing that I did was I went and turned to God for help. Now, uh, you know, turning to God for help is not always the first thing that we want to do. It's not always something that we ever feel like doing. And I have three reasons listed why people don't turn to God and be persistent in prayer. And I'll tell you straight up, this is me, this is me, and this is me. Okay, so each of these examples, or these, these you might be your reason, has been me in my lifetime. It's probably why I came up with them. One reason why people aren't persistent in prayer is because of a lack of faith. They just say, you know what, I don't think God's going to do this, or I don't see how it's possible that God's going to make this happen. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 58, Jesus was in Nazareth, his hometown, wanting to do miracles, but he says, I can't because these people don't have enough faith. And so they're not persistent in asking, they're not persistent in prayer, and that's one reason why people don't pray. Just do not have faith that God is going to come through. Because God does, is not a genie in a bottle. God is not going to do anything and everything that I want him to do. I can have a lack of faith and say, you know what? I'm not going to pray. Another reason why it's hard to be persistent in prayer is a lack of action on God's part. Because God doesn't immediately solve my problem when I want it to. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, it says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most is going to grow cold. As we go through this crazy and mixed up world and we see more evil prevailing and more people getting away with something that they've done wrong, there's going to be a majority of people who say, you know what, I'm not interested in trusting God. Look what he let happen in whatever situation that it is. He's not coming through. He's not answering as I want him to. And people will say, you know what, God, you didn't answer how I wanted you to last time. I'm not going to trust you this time. You think about people who have prayed for a loved one who is going through a medical situation and they didn't survive. Well, God, you just let uncle so-and-so die. Why am I going to pray and spend all this time being persistent now? Because you didn't do it then. And people use that as an excuse. A third reason is just a lack of dedication. Um, you have Luke 18 verses 1 through 8. You have this 
the example of the widow who is persistent in praying. And, and she just keeps going back to this guy who can help her. And the guy says, I don't care about God. I don't care about this woman. I care about me. I'm tired of having this woman coming back to me day after day. She's going to wear me out. Fine, I'm just going to give her what she wants. But how many of us say that I am a persistent prayer? I know there are some of you who are persistent. Maybe you're thinking, Josh, you're a loser. You're not persistent. Josh, you have a lack of faith. Josh, that you're, you're not trusting God long enough. But these are reasons why people are not persistent in prayer. They don't want to put the time into it. They just don't remember that they need to be persistent in praying for these things. It is hard to be persistent in prayer. You know, sometimes when I pray, I feel like God's giving me this answer. Are you going to trust me, Josh? Are you going to trust me, Josh? Are you going to trust me? Like, I am like, okay, God, please help me to just keep trusting you. While I'm praying, help me to keep trusting you. The, the scripture reading for today is one that I need to tattoo across my forehead. Except for it's too big. Otherwise, I... <laughs> This is what God said, has Isaiah the prophet write that are his words. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I have no idea what God's big picture is. What is it that he's wanting to accomplish? God's working with six billion people and... And 20 time zones and uh, nature and everything he's put set all together to create a beautiful story and working all things out for the good of those who love him. It's not all about me. He's working all this out together. And if I can remember that, I say, OK, I can be persistent in praying. I can trust God in spite of what's going on because he's got it in his hands. God is in control. We need to be persistent in prayer. But we also need to make sure that we are being persistent in godliness. Psalms chapter 4, verses 2 through 8 says, How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. In your anger, do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and trust the Lord. Many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with good, greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you, O Lord, O Lord make me dwell in safety. David's situation was one of... Multiple people who are wicked, multiple people who are causing turmoil and wreaking havoc in his life. And David didn't use that as an excuse to say, okay, time out on the godliness thing. I'm going to take care of this and go back to being godly. His goal all the way through was to be godly. And it's for, to me, when I look at the, what he had to go through, it was quite an ordeal. There was a lot of reasons why I would say, okay, forget the godliness because I want to do what the flesh wants to do. But David said, I'm not going to do that. So first of all, we, we mentioned about, uh, from Psalms chapter 3, about his son Absalom, who stole the hearts of all the people. Okay, that's, that's a pretty tough thing, that your own, my right-hand man here, my son, is turning against me to take my throne. Any dad's excited about that? No, that instantly makes me mad. If it's my kid that's doing that, that's just one person. Another person was a guy by the name of Ahithopel. He was David's counselor, his advisor, the one that David turned to for advice. When Absalom took over the throne, guess what ah Ahithopel did? He switched sides. He jumped ships. He, said he left David to go to be with the enemy. Okay, that's where the right-hand man comes in. Wait a second. You were on my side, and now you're going to that side? Does that make you happy? No, that would, that would just, I think, irritate you. Uh, number three, another guy was by the name of Shimei. He was from the same clan as Saul. Saul was king before David was. Well, what, this guy apparently didn't like David and was thinking, good, you're finally getting what you deserve. Now we're going to have somebody else be king. And it wasn't just that he was going neener, neener at this. Uh, he was cursing David and his men. He was throwing rocks at them. He was pelting them with dirt. 
And, and David did not stop it. David had some soldiers that said, hey, let me take care of this guy. He, he won't even know what hit him. You just keep on going, David, and I'll take care of this. And David says, no, I'm not going to do that. What an embarrassment. What a shame to David that he's not even dealing with this enemy that he could easily snuff out or have one of his eye, men just quick. There's an arrow. He's done. And there's no problems. So when you think about this Psalms chapter four, my son has turned against me. My advisor, my right hand man has turned against me. And now some lowly scum of a clan is pelting me with dirt and rocks and insults. Tough time to be godly. I mean, anybody like, does it burn in you a little bit that I want revenge on any of this? That's, that's how I feel. I feel like it would be difficult, especially for David, a military man. He's used to killing people. He's used to going to battle. He's used to snuffing out the bad guys. And now he just has to sit there quietly while someone steals his throne, while somebody betrays him, and while some jerk is cursing him all the way through. But through it all, David says, I'm keeping my relationship with God and I'm going to keep my godliness this whole way through. Because he had a relationship with God, he says, I can trust God. And then he was able to relax through all of this and go to sleep at night and wake up refreshed. And then he was still able to rely on God for the outcome. And David didn't know how this was all going to turn out. We look at this and it's like, if we read through this enough to understand it, it's, it's, it's kind of a cool story, but it's already done. It's already over with and we, we can easily move on. But for somebody who's going through this hour by hour, minute by minute, stress by stress, not knowing what is actually going to happen, it was a big deal. But David said, I'm going to keep my godliness. I'm going to keep, my, uh, keep trusting God through all of this. The wicked are going to always be around. In every walk of life, the wicked, you're still going to have the, the football team that still cheats to win the game, right? You're still gonna have people in your classrooms that are getting away with cheating. You're still gonna have people at work that are still undercutting you with the sales, right? There's still going to be wickedness everywhere. And people are even going to invent ways of doing evil. Right? There's no end to this. I mean, it's just, we, we invent new electronics. Noah got a drone yesterday. Pretty cool. It, it, I mean, he got it on Christmas Day, but it can, it's got a little camera, and it, it can shoot this way, and it can shoot down. Well, that, that wasn't the first drone that was ever invented, right? The first one we had was like these dinky little things, and they get a little bit bigger, and now we finally got one with the camera. Well, think about that with evil. We got a little bit of crime going on, and then we're going to invent a new way, a new adaptation to it, a new way to get away with this. And that's the way wickedness is. It's never going to stop until Jesus comes back and rules on this earth and takes care of it. It's always going to be there. And us, if we're the righteous people, we need to be persistent in godliness. We need to be persistent in prayer and trusting God and be persistent in doing the right thing, not giving in to what the wicked are doing. Now, David was one of those people. He was persistent in doing the right thing. Now, David, we all know, wasn't perfect. Uh, you know, he was a guy who committed adultery and committed murder. And that's one of those things that is like bigger and obvious, more obvious than, than David, light in, in the eyes of the Bible and what people read. But in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5, it says, For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. He wasn't perfect, but he was pretty darn good in trying to keep his relationship right with God and being godly at the same time. He was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't just a moral man, because there's a lot of moral people out there that say, you know what, I'm pro-life. I'm pro-marriage. I'm pro-everything that's good. But it's just because they have some kind of conviction, because they're a moral person. But being godly the way God's asked us to do isn't just because I have some kind of conviction. It's because I love God. It's because God hates this that I'm going to take the stand for life, the stand for marriage, the stand for everything that God would want. So I want to encourage you to be persistent in doing the right thing, 
In no way is it going to be easy, especially when you see the wicked getting away with everything. It's going to, there's going to be this draw, this temptation to go that way, but be persistent in being godly. Being godly carries with it some benefits. Here's three of them. The first, it says the godly are set aside by the Lord. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. He has set them aside because he wants to use them. That's what God did for David way before David became king. When he was out a shepherd boy, he's out there taking care of his sheep. You know, it's the hot, sunny day, and God's looking down from heaven and watching David take his sheep and lead them to the green pastures and by the fresh water. When David's playing his harp under the, under the, with the breeze and under the branches, when he's playing his harp, God's keeping his eye on him and says, here's a godly man. Here is somebody who's after my own heart. I think I'm going to use David for something. And what was true then is true now. Your walk with the Lord now is going to have an impact on how God uses you later. What you do now impacts how God can use you later. God sets aside the godly for himself. That's a pretty special honor uh, in my mind that God would, would choose anybody and say, I want to use them for anything. But that's what's clearly stated. That's what he did for David. And that's kind of the same thing he wants to do with you. The second thing is that it says the prayers of the godly are heard. A lot of unsaved, ungodly people praying, asking God, get me out of this situation. Please keep me safe. I don't think God's interested in any of that. The one prayer that he's interested of the ungodly is, I'm a sinner. Please save me. Then, he, then they become godly in his eyes. And he says, okay, now I can, I'll, I'll listen to everything else that you're praying. But if you're just praying for, I want to win the lottery. I want to A in my test. I want safety and travels. But you have nothing to do with God. He's not interested in those prayers. But if you are godly, if you're walking with the Lord, God hears your prayers. The third one is the, God, the godly have enduring spirits. Maybe that's worded funny, but you find that um, in verse 7 it says, You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. He says they have joy and they have peace. Joy is an inner contentment and a, a satisfaction that has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. You know, a lot of kids woke up on Christmas morning with joy, right? Their earthly sense of joy. I have all these presents. I have all this food. I get family together. And then if they didn't get what they want, what's immediately what happens? Well, where's the joy? I, you know, it's, that's the world's view of joy. It's like based off of my situation. The joy that God wants you to have is like the even kill joy that's always there in spite of what's going, ha in spite of what's going on. The other thing David has was peace, it means tranquility. It's a common expression of dying or resting in peace. The person who is in the grave, they, that's what they say, that may they rest in peace. Every, every worry or concern that they had in their lifetime is gone. The, the aches and pains that their body had disappeared. That cancer that they were fighting is no longer something they, they have to deal with. They're resting in peace. And God doesn't want you to wait until you're dead to rest in peace. He wants you to be alive and at church and on the basketball court and in school and driving your car with this same kind of peace that the person who's resting in peace has. But the ungodly are not going to experience that. The godly who are walking with the Lord are the people who are going to experience that. And, and it's pretty easy to recognize when I'm, when I'm walking in a godly way or an ungodly way. If I'm letting my problems overwhelm me to the point where I'm constantly stressed out and I'm not, and I've, I've been there, that's why I can think of this, um, being overwhelmed by my problems instead of trusting the Lord, then I'm not walking in a godly way. I'm walking in the human flesh thinking, I can do this, I can handle this, instead of saying, okay, the godly thing is to give it to God and to trust Him with it. When I try to understand what I can't understand, or I get caught up in trying, or um, I'm relying on myself to get something done, I'm not walking in a godly way. I'm walking in Josh's fleshly way instead of in the way that God wants me to walk. So we have this call to be persistent in prayer. We have this call to be godly. And it is a challenge. It is a challenge to be godly. 
Uh, David talks a little bit about this. Um, the first one is to refrain from sin. Verse 2 says, How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Refraining from sin. You know, when I think about this, the sin particularly that he's talking about in verse 4, it says, In your anger do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your heart to be silent. I think about, I don't think about a great big awful kind of sin. I think of it as something small, something about just worrying. That's all, all David, I can think about at this point in David's life is he's just going to be sitting on his bed worrying and not trusting God about what is going to happen. And he's saying, don't do it. Refuse to let yourself worry. Uh, don't ever do it. Don't choose to it. When you recognize it, stop it. At the moment you start to worry, take it to the Lord. Over and over until finally you have that peace that God wants you to have that passes all understanding. All understanding. Refrain from sin. The second thing is to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 5 says, offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. Now for them, that's a little bit different. That's the animal sacrifices that they're supposed to give to the Lord. We don't have to do that, thankfully. Um, that's not something that God's asked us to do, but we are still called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We're still asked to use our time as our money, use our um, talents, whatever we have, use those for the Lord. And to do it genuinely. Um, then when we're giving money or volunteering to do something for the Lord, do it the best that we can wholeheartedly as if I'm really giving this money to the Lord, as if I'm really doing this play for the Lord, as if I'm really shoveling this snow for my neighbor, as if I'm doing it for the Lord because God's asked me to do it. That is a challenge. It's a challenge that, hey, you can do this. It's a challenge because it is hard to do. And the third thing is to trust God. And that's what David did. Verse 5, he says, Offer right sacrifices and trust in the Lord. I'm going to do what God's asking me to do, and I'm going to trust Him for the outcome. Whatever it is that God wants me to do, whatever He wants to have happen, I'm just going to trust Him to accomplish what it is that He wants to accomplish. Definitely a challenge, because in the midst of doing it and trusting God and it's not going the direction I want to go, immediately I want to take back the controls and go the other direction or to do something else. But David's saying just trust God in the midst of it. Keep going where he's asking you to go. Being persistent in positives. We get excited uh, about things such as of what the world has that we can be persistent in that are good. Playing basketball, right? We, get per we can be persistent in that, and we, we can get excited about that. Persistence in playing music. Persistence in exercise, even if it's not your thing. Some people get a kick out of that, and they just get persistent. They'll get up early every morning, or they'll do it every night. Persistence in saving money as you watch that account grow. But I just want to encourage you, 21's coming. Start today. Be persistent in what David was persistent in. Be persistent in prayer and be persistent in godliness. David demonstrated it. Uh, we, have an ex we have an example of what David did and that was for us to follow. I just want to encourage you. You're going to be persistent in a number of other things. Make sure you just add on to that list and make more important be persistent in prayer and persistent in godliness. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. God, you know how fallible and, and how much we struggle, God, to be persistent. I know I, I struggle to be persistent in a lot of things, uh, exercise or in playing the guitar or um, reading a book, God, and I just, all those other things that we want to be persistent in, I, I just pray that they would be secondary to what you're asking us to be persistent in, to be persistent in praying and to be persistent in godliness. God, we don't know how much time we have left, maybe a few days, maybe 20 years, um, but God, please help us just to excel in this for as long as we have breath, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.